What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. Ladies and gents, uh, welcome back to the Born and Made podcast. I have a guest that I have been listening to for a long time. Uh, Jay Ferugia has one of the most listened to uh, fitness podcasts in the game, Renegade Radio. If you do not listen to Renegade Radio and you like doing anything that requires uh, movement and hard work with your body, you are making a big Old mistake. Uh, he is such a great guy to listen to. Everything that he says uh, is just really inspiring, and um, he's a no bullshit guy. He has been a fitness and nutrition coach for 25 plus years. Really been doing the things that everybody thinks is new uh, forever. Uh, really, one of the first uh, guys to be really doing like all the hit stuff that you see right now and the sort of the the conventional unconventional training um really is just one of the masters in the world of of fitness and um loves old school hip-hop which makes me very happy uh comes from jersey which is very close to my home uh and so we we definitely speak the same language is a yankee fan is a new york giants fan is an author and just an awesome dude. Uh, welcome to the show, Jay Ferugia. Dude, it's the greatest intro of all time. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm so excited to have you on, man, because I, I, you know, at least three days a week, I'm listening to uh, your podcasts and, uh, and, and just the content that you put out there. I, I love it. And I think that you're one of those guys that I just like, as soon as I found found out about you uh i connected to right away and when i find that and it's not easy to find you know stuff that you can just consistently listen to and and find and 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 get the get the content that you're actually excited to 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 be to to take in um it's awesome and so i like reached out to you on a whim and uh and and we connected and so i really appreciate what you do man um Born or Made is a podcast where I, where I get to sit down with people like you that have really inspired me and probably millions of others uh, over, over the years that you've been doing what you're doing. Um, and we talk about this nature-nurture thing, whether you were born or whether you were made. Uh, and I, I like to believe that uh, there is some sort of science to it. Uh, I don't know, and I don't think anybody really has the definitive answer. Uh, but uh, the way we get there is I get into your story, and I know that you've got a really, really interesting story. There's a couple of things that I'd love for you to unpack for us and um, take it back to as early as you can remember. Uh, and I'll you know, extrapolate a few things and interrupt you along the way to see if we can figure that out. And then I'd love to just talk to you about fitness and nutrition, which is what you, you're, you're an expert at. So uh, why don't we dive into your story, man? Why don't you try to, try to give us the, the scoop uh, from as early as you can remember? Yeah. So, you know, as a young kid, I was always just super shy, quiet, insecure. Uh, first, I was a fat kid. Then I was a skinny fat kid was never the most athletic kid, never the first person picked like, you know, at recess to be on the, the kickball team or the, 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 you know, nerf football team or whatever we're playing. Um, you know, not, not, not a superstar athlete by any stretch, but I was always really into sports, you know, Walter Payton, uh, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, LT, Phil Sims, you know, all those kind of guys. Um, I idolized growing up, Ricky Henderson, uh, Dave Winfield, Mattingly, you know, all, all guys you remember. Um, and actually, to this day, one of my favorite forms of exercise is hill sprints. And that was, I started doing those in 1985 because of Walter Payton. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, so I, I did, you know, I, I played all the sports and everything, but I was, I was really shy and quiet and I didn't have a ton of friends. And 
every Saturday morning I would get up and I would watch WWE. I would watch wrestling. I would watch, you know, Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, and Randy Savage, and Ricky Steamboat, and the British Bulldogs. And I was like, man, I, I want to be like those guys one day. And prior to that, I was watching cartoons every Saturday morning. And then in the 80s, it was Arnold and Stallone. I was like, man, I want to be like those guys. So I always had these aspirations to go from this skinny, fat, weak, insecure kid to this larger than life superhero kind of guy, which was so far from where I was. Um, and so I started weight training because I, you know, it's kind of like I, 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 it's funny. I could never remember the names of the kids that used to like bully me and whatnot until about two years ago. I was in the float tank. Do you, do you do float tanks? I've tried them. I haven't. I I'm, I I know that they're incredible. I've just yeah. haven't been able to quiet myself yet. To quiet myself yeah. down enough yet to do it. Well, it's something that you get better at, like meditation. Like I, I just introduced a friend to it the other day, and because I go for two hours, and he's like, "What?" Wow. And I said, "Dude, you, you're 30, 45 minutes. You're gonna lose your mind the first time." I wasn't this. I was so far from this person. I admired all these wrestlers and superheroes and and Stallone and all these guys. But I was so far from that. So I have to program myself to be like that every day because as humans, we can default to, you know, what we were programmed during the first seven years of our lives. We can de just, you know, our species, we can default to negative thinking, negative behavior. So I want to start the day with positivity, po uh, program myself with positivity. So I play the music, I write in a journal, and I write uh, three things and three people that I'm grateful for. And a lot of times it ends up being 17 people that I'm grateful for. Uh, I just can continue writing. And then... Uh, I write affirmations and I write one to three things every day of what I want to live into. And usually those are pretty repetitive, but you know, that sounds woo woo, whatever, but so many people that are super successful have done it. Arnold's talked about it. I mean, Ali talked about it. Ali said, um, uh, the, the repetition of affirmations, uh, I mean, I'm going to screw up the quote now, but something about it. The repetition of affirmations eventually becomes a deep seated belief. And when it becomes a deep seated belief, then things really start to happen. So, you know, and, and you could program your mind, right? Like, like someone who's abused as a kid or told you're not good enough or you're too short to play basketball or you're this, you're that. You believe those things as a kid. So as an adult, you can reprogram or program your mind to believe something else. And then eventually when you believe it, everyone around you believes it and it starts to change your whole world, it starts to change how you view the world, how you view yourself, how people view you, what people say around you or what people don't say around you. It's an interesting journey, but if you have negative people around you who maybe complain and gossip, if you go on this journey and eventually reprogram yourself, they stop saying that. They may say it to other people, but they don't do it around you because they know your energy and they know what you tolerate. So good, man. All right, so back to back to uh, your childhood. So you were you were a fat kid, then you were a skinny fat kid, and then you what? So I was in the float tank about two right. years ago, and I for whatever reason I must have repressed it, right? And I couldn't think of the names of these five kids. If you paid me, I'd be like, I, I don't remember. And I was in the float tank. I came home. Jen was making dinner. And I said these five names. And she's like, yeah, wh who are those? What are you talking about? I was like, those are the kids that used to bully me as a kid. Why I had a chip on my shoulder. I figured out why I do certain things, why I don't do certain things. And it was this crazy breakthrough. That's why I, I love the float tank so much. But, um, and you know, and then, and then I still remember freshman year of high school, walking down the hall, like just a skinny, fat, little nerdy dude, getting shoved in the locker. And I remember being like, I was so small that I fit in the locker and I was terrified. I was only in there for probably five seconds before someone let me out. But you know, that really inspired me. And my freshman year of high school was uh, the year that Straight Outta Compton came out, the year that uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions came out. Uh, so many great albums that year in 88. And um, so I'm listening to those every day in my headphones, my Walkman. I'm super angry. My parents had just gotten divorced uh, a month before I went to a brand new school where I knew nobody. So man, was I angry. I was insecure. I was quiet. I barely made any friends for like the first two or three years of high school. But I'm training the whole time because I'm like, all right, this is the only thing I, I can do to you know build up that suit of armor and help me not be so insecure and whatnot. And I didn't know what I was doing. So I graduated high school at six feet tall and 147 pounds. So that was after four years of hard training. And uh, eventually I, I kind of figured it out. You know, I, I went to college and got really obsessed with it. Read every book, every magazine, ordered every kind of course you could get from the back of Iron Man in those days, every VHS tape, uh, got certified, started interning in the school weight room. And then, you know, from there, eventually it made it my career. You started training in high school. And I, I you know, 
it's so interesting because I grew up in New York City, right? And in New York City, it could be the only place on the planet where there's really no sports in high school. There's like, there's just no sports. There's no like Friday night lights in New York right. City. And so there's no kids like I just there was no kids in my periphery that were lifting weights. Weight training didn't come into my life until way later on, until my 30s, really. You know, like I did other things in athletics, but I just never got into weight training. And so, I mean, did you were you did you find yourself like escaping into the weights as a kid? Or will you just like yeah. naturally gravitate to to it? I just I, I fell in love with it immediately, and it was it was an escape too. You know, it was like all right, I can control this. I can work hard. Uh, I'm not you know people aren't making fun of me. They're not bullying me, and I felt like it would lead somewhere. Like you know, like everyone from The Rock to Arnold's talked about it. Like I could take these lessons and apply them to life and the hard work and all that. Um, and then my my cousin Christine, this was kind of a surreal thing. She started dating. This was probably like 1989-ish. She started dating a professional wrestler and they lived right down the street from us. So I got to be around him all the time. And uh, you know, he would help me out with stuff. In retrospect, it was the wrong thing for a newbie to be doing. But uh, that was really cool because I got to see this guy in person. I was like, all right, I, I can do this. I can a WWF this. wrestler or WWE? He wasn't. He, he was like a smaller federation guy. But he was, mm -hmm. you know, he was like 6'4", 260. I remember so clearly uh and this is before the wwe was it was the wwf and i was a mega fan mega like the ultimate warrior i i i will have to admit probably was my idol from like six years old till got you know until he like disappeared um yeah. That guy was 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 incredible. I loved I, I and, and until you said that, I actually had not thought about my total infatuation with professional wrestling. I loved professional wrestling uh, yeah, as a kid. Yeah. So, you know, when did you when did when did you figure out that fitness was fitness and fitness coaching was going to be your thing? So I, I went into college uh, majoring in communications because I thought I was either going to uh, host sports center or something or make films, um, which in retrospect was crazy because I never talked. So I don't know how I thought I was going to have a talk show or like, you know, I was super quiet, but um, I, I'm training and, and I'm, I'm getting more and more into it. I'm learning more. And I started to just immediately, which to this day, whenever I learn anything, I think it's one of the best ways to to kind of retain it like if i uh read a book about marketing or a book about mindset or something immediately i'll share it with close friends I'm like hey man here's what i and, and so i think it's you know if you can learn it and then teach it and apply it you're going to be more likely to retain it long term so i started doing that just naturally with the training stuff i was like oh you know teaching not really teaching but sharing with with some like roommates and friends that we would train with and i just found that i was way more into it than they were so i started interning in the weight room then um, I got super sick, Soph sophomore year. Yeah, I uh, actually got tuberculosis, which is crazy. Wow. I didn't like I had never heard of anyone getting that after Doc Holiday. You know, I thought it was long gone. So I got tuberculosis, and I had to come home, and I had to be uh, I had to stay home. So this is actually the second time that I've been quarantined. I had to stay home for three months. I had to take like eighty pills a day that made my pee fire engine red. I, I lost all my hair, and uh, wow. but during that time is when I got my first certification and all day I would just lay on the couch and I lost like, I had struggled and worked so hard to gain weight and I lost like 30, 40 pounds during that time. But uh, every day I would just lay on the couch and watch this stack of VHS training tapes that I got. I went through a couple different certification courses, read every book I could possibly uh, order. And so that was from like January to that June or July. That summer I started training people and uh, I, I was just so in love with it and it was going so well. And, you know, I didn't know a ton about training. I didn't know a ton about business. But all of a sudden it was just really picking up and really going well that I was like, I, I got to transfer back home because I can't leave now. I have this clientele built up. So I transferred schools, came back home. And uh, then for the next two years while I was going to school, I built up the training business. And um, I basically would 
train people at their houses. And then I saved every dime I made. And like I said, for, for whatever reason, the business was really blowing up fast. So I was making pretty good money. And uh, I saved every dime and then invested it to the, where I could rent a small space, like a thousand square foot space in a basement. So it was literally underground. And, um, and then for the next five, six, seven years, I would invest every dime I made just back into the business, buying new power racks, glued ham raises, cable machines, always upgrading. And you know, my, like my 21st birthday, I was in bed at nine o'clock because I had to get up at five to train clients. I wasn't out drinking. So I basically, there was a period where, you know, it wasn't until like I was 28 that I actually went out and partied like people do in college. Like I did freshman year and then that was it. And then I was mm -hmm. just working. So 20, like from 28 to 33 was like my college years where I started going out and drinking and partying a little bit more. But from, from 19 to 28, I was just 12 hours a day just grinding away, building the training business. Wow. You know, it's like I was born in 1980. And uh, I, so I'll be 40 this year. And I gotta say that like, I feel like, and you probably, you know definitely better than, than me and probably most people, the kind of training that people are talking about now, strength training, uh, any sort of group fitness training, um, like that stuff, Nobody was really doing that up until about like, like at a lot at, at like the scale that it is today ever. Right. Like it, it was no. never for whatever reason right now for the first time in history, I think weightlifting is actually something that people respect in like in a way that's like no one would ever consider somebody that would that would lift weights in the gym an athlete back in the day, right? right? Like, right. unless you're, unless you were in the industry and like, you knew that like to become a bodybuilder is one of the hardest things to do. It's just, it, 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 the grind is so hard. And so it's just interesting to me to see that, like, I remember growing up, like any, you'd think about like, oh, some guy, somebody, somebody going to, to lift weights is like, you know, a, like worse than a jock, right? Like somebody that's just <laughs> yeah. like, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah, and, yeah. and, and that is such not totally. the case. So funny. It's just, it's just not the case. It's wild. It's wild to see how things can flip because I think ultimately people have started to realize and we would never have imagined that, right? Like you wouldn't have imagined that 20 years ago. It was, it's so different now. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. And, and, and yeah. I can only imagine that like, you're probably in like, you're chuckling in the back of your head. Like you're just like, I fucked the, I, the whole time. This is what, this is what I've been doing. Like, what, like what, you know, yeah. like, so what is that like to see an industry that was really underground or got like, like kind of made fun of for so many years yeah. and not respected the way it is today at all, um, to come to like this amazing place where like you are one of the foremost leaders in this space. I mean, how does that, like, what is that like? Yeah, it's crazy because I remember when I first really started to kind of find my niche and my voice and, and we had, you know, one of the original underground warehouse box style gyms, so many people all the time, even my dad was like, what are you doing? This is a waste of time. You can't be playing that rap music. No one listens to rap music, which now again, something totally the most accepted thing in the world. Uh, no one wants to hear that. What are you doing with all these chains and tires and all this stuff? This isn't going to work. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, but it was still really, it was not a mainstream thing at all. It's like you said, like people would just look down upon you as, oh yeah, like, yeah, I remember girls would be like, they would make fun of you if you, if you were obsessed with working out, you know? Um, but it is weird. So basically when, when I started, your only option was to go to Gold's or World Gym. And if you wanted to do anything beyond just one-on-one -on -one training, and back then the only training was, was bodybuilding was like, you know, what? Flex Wheeler or, or uh, Yates or Porter Cottrell or uh, whoever was doing in the magazines. There wasn't like this huge powerlifting influence, strength and conditioning. Uh, nobody was using kettlebells or doing any odd object stuff. And so I, there was this book. So I, I became just for whatever reason obsessed with all this old school stuff. And I found uh, where you could order these old books from the early 1900s, the 1950s, 60s. So I was reading all this old stuff and I loved it. And so I started to implement a lot of that stuff. 
uh, you know, George Hackenschmidt and uh, Arthur Saxon and then uh, John McCallum and so many different things, through, you know, throughout the, the first 50 years of, of kind of the Iron Game. And then in 96, a book came out called, uh, called Dinosaur Training. And that was the first one where we really talked about using kegs and barrels and sandbags and anvils and sledgehammers. So you couldn't just go on like Rogue or something and order that in those days. You had to go all over the place. So we, we somehow, one of my clients knew a guy who knew a guy who worked on like the docks in Jersey City. So we went down there and we got uh, ropes that they would use to tie up the boats um, to, you, you know, to do like rope rows and tug of war stuff outside. And we would go to old uh, liquor stores and get old kegs and fill them up. And we would just go to the Army Navy store and make our own sandbags. And uh, we got chains actually from, from the from the boat uh, going down to the docks too, <laughs> and and uh, you know now everybody has rings right like everyone's doing ring dips and ring muscle ups. But the re- the way I started doing rings in the mid '90s was because Larry Scott, who was the first Mister Olympia, which I believe was 1959, uh, said ring push ups and ring flies were two of his favorite chest exercises. And man, we had to search high and low to find gymnastics rings. And, uh, you, you know, in those days when there's no internet, you drive, like if I found something I wanted, you, you drive six hours to Northern Pennsylvania and get it and drive back, you know? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, and so, so that was how we kind of started it. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we grew so fast because th- that was so far removed from what everyone else was doing. People were like, Oh, I gotta be there. So for every, uh, I think like four or five high schools around, I had like the leading rusher, uh, the leading scorer, the leading st- uh, the guy who was leading in stolen bases. Like we had so many superstar athletes coming in. And then we started doing was doing our strongman days outside so people would drive by and see it. And that was such great marketing. Like what the hell is this? Because they were used to just going to do the Cybex circuit at, at Golds or something. Uh, so it continued to blow up. And then it, finally, like as sports specific training caught on, this multi-million dollar facility opened up right down the street. People were like, oh, that's going to put you out of business. That's going to hurt you really. Uh, and I was like, nah, I, I don't care. And I remember they saying, someone told me, they were like, that kid in the basement, that fucking Ferrugia kid in the basement is killing our business. Like everyone's going there. What do we have to do? <laughs> um, and, and there was also no such thing as you alluded to. There's no such thing as group training. And so I always claim that I started group training, which I think I did. Uh, uh, I was training people one-on-one and then I got my first athlete. Uh, who now is in his mid thirties? He this was uh, he, he started with me when he was thirteen. He's like a little brother to me to this day, and uh, he was a wrestler and football player. So I trained him for that, and then within three months, he's like, "Oh, my, my buddy wants to come in." Then another buddy came in, and then uh, I kind of just was like, "All right, well, everyone should train in groups. It's better. It's more fun. You're getting better results." And then so mm-hmm. my whole business was group training, like small, three to four people, and bigger groups after that for the next decade or so. I just find it to be so interesting and especially I can't even imagine what it's like sitting in your seat where you're just like you've seen the whole entire thing, you know, like from the early days in like bodybuilding, um, like in the 80s when it was like the Arnold's of the world. Right. Uh, Till now, which is like, you know, you go to Instagram and every single person on Instagram is like (laughs) it's like a is like a body, you know, like a a fitness guru. Um, so your podcast is, is, uh, is an incredible podcast, not only because it's just a great place for people to come to and, and uh, like hear your sort of no bullshit kind of way of delivering information in a fun way, um, yeah. but how did the podcast start? Like when did the podcast start? I think it's been, I don't know if it's been six or seven years now. So we, we moved to LA uh, almost 10 years ago and one of the the major reasons for us moving is I wanted to give myself, you know, I talked a little bit about my evolution, but I was like, I feel like I've come so far, but I have so far to go. And I kind of just had this awakening, like that there was a lot of underlying issues and self limiting beliefs and my worldview that I want to change, but I didn't think I was strong enough to do it in the same uh, surroundings. And I knew that environment would trigger certain behaviors. And uh, so I was like, I want to move 3,000 miles away. I got to get away. I got to reinvent myself. I got to start over and really work on something. So I came here and I just started doing a lot of different things. Like before that, my, my life was just going to the gym and being in the gym for 12 hours a day. So I was like, let me, you know, so I went to improv at Second City for like two years, which helped me so much to get out of my shell and to 
And then I started uh, taking guitar. And I but, started just but, but let's talk about that because I, I've also heard you talk about improv. Um, and why, so you, 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 really, you really say that improv is such a great thing, especially if you want to be a coach. Improv is such a great tool. Why is that? Uh, because it teaches you. So we have public speaking classes. You have uh, uh, so many things just about how to speak or project or whatever. But you don't have listening classes. And listening is like a superpower. If you're a really good listener in one-on-one -on -one conversations or at a party, um, people will never forget you. Like I, I, You could be out somewhere and I could get a text from a friend and it could be like, Yo, thanks so much for hooking me up with Michael. He's awesome. He's a super cool guy. And then I could talk to you and you'd be like, yeah, but I barely said anything. But you probably asked them meaningful questions that made him feel important. So I, I feel like improv teaches you listening skills, A, which is super important, and just the ability to think on your feet. It's public speaking, people's biggest fear, right? You're up in, in front of a group of people. If you're thinking on your feet, and yes and, the yes and part I think is crucial because the first rule of improv is yes and. So whatever you say, if you and I are on stage doing a scene, and if you say, hey, I, I got a gun, and I'm like, oh no, that's an ice cream cone, then the scene's dead. So you never, yet, uh, you never know anybody, it's yes and. Whatever you say, I agree with, and maybe I heighten it. Now, how does that apply to real life? Incredibly, because you take that, if you apply that to real life, uh, to business, right? So somebody works for you, and they say, Hey, uh, Mike, I'm gonna, I wanna paint the, uh, the walls of the restaurant red. And, and you're thinking, what a horrible idea. But you go, yeah, Jay, I, I see what you're, where you're going with that. Like, okay, and why? Yeah, yeah, I got it, okay, okay. All right, well, let's mull it over, let's think about it. Instead of just going, no, that's a horrible idea, you know what I mean? So it teaches you, if you, if you keep that idea mm -hmm. in mind, with your wife, with your friends, like, you, you resist the urge to just say no. Because as soon as you say no, our relationship's over. You know, if you and I met at a party randomly, and you said, uh, if I mentioned Pearl Jam, you might hate Pearl Jam. But if I said it's my favorite, you, your natural inclination like, oh, dude, you know what? Metallica is way better. Now we're, we're dead. Like, you've told me I'm wrong. You know what I mean? So, like, and no matter what someone brings up, you could use that. Whether you love Trump or Obama or whatever, someone brings that up, I'm going to be like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to know him. No, no, no. So I think that's just really powerful to keep that concept in mind and use it. I think that... Probably just about my, the thing I hate most, could be most in life, honestly. Wow, could be drum roll. Top three, top three. All right. I don't want to say right, most, sure. but top three. All right. The immediate dismissal. Yes. The immediate dismissal for me is pretty much the easiest, fastest, most efficient way to get me to never want to fucking talk to you again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's totally. but that's just the truth. And 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 it's even worse when it's with somebody that you have to communicate with, right? Like Yeah. I I think that that you know, and and Donna, I love you, trust me, you're my wife. Sometimes my wife will just boom, just throw that no, just like not even think like there's no possible way that you could you could make an educated thoughtful decision in a second you're either ta right. you're taking a risk you're taking a risk right like yeah you just are taking a risk by just saying immediately yes or immediately no yeah no matter what and you're taking a much bigger risk when you're saying yes because you just got to go along with it but when you're saying no the risk that you're really taking is a i could be wrong b i'm i could i could really piss this person off so I love the yes and. Um, those immediate no's are the fucking worst, dude. Yeah. They're the yeah. worst. I hate them. You have to really curate who you allow around you, first and foremost. Uh, but sometimes people get good at that, right? They're like, I don't want to spend time with those people. I'm only spending people, uh, time with people who uplift me, who are on the same path, who think positively. But then you'll watch the news and you'll scroll through negative shit on Facebook. And I, that's something that I consciously try to get better at where just the other day I was listening to one of my training mixes and two of the songs were like, I was like, man, I love these artists. I love these songs, but this is so angry and so negative and it's, it's not making me feel good. And it, it might seem like minutia, 
But I, I, I have two friends that survived cancer, and they won't even watch certain movies or certain shows. Be like, nah, it doesn't make me feel good. Because anything that doesn't make you feel good, that's negativity, that's stressful, that's anxiety causing, that's filling your, your body with chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline, that can lead to you getting cancer for the first time, for the second time, whatever, or any disease. Like it's just unhealthy. So I think you should be like almost obsessive about what you allow in, like in your immediate radius, in your eyes, in your ears. Like you gotta really be uh, serious about that. It's just as important as what you allow in your mouth, right? Totally. But being a coach is, you know, you could know everything there is to know about fitness and nutrition. In your opinion, do you think being a coach is more about a mental relationship game than it is about the science and the facts that you know? 99.9% of the time, yeah. Yeah. If it was like, if it was someone like you or a pro athlete, or someone who's trained really hard properly for 20 years, uh, then we got to get into the science and the advanced stuff. But for the majority of people, it's, it's, it's not any of those things. It's more just building the relationship, keeping people accountable, simplifying, because now more than ever, people are super overwhelmed about what to do, what not to do. They're scared, uh, all, all, all these food, one week this food causes cancer, one week uh, it causes you to lose your memory. You know, like people are, very confused. So I think a lot of it is just kind of, you know, simplify, giving someone a, a, a clear cut path and then just holding them accountable. We all need accountability. We all need coaching. We all need outside eyes. We all have blind spots and weaknesses. And so you're going to get further doing anything if you have a mentor or accountability. Uh, you could give someone the perfect plan and they'll go and do it, but they'll overthink it. They, they, whatever. If you give someone a plan that's 80% as good as that, but they're checking in with someone and they're actually doing it and someone's holding them accountable, you're gonna get much better results. You uh, live and, and are a huge proponent of the 80-20, which I mm. absolutely sign up for on a daily basis outside of when I'm competing for some sort of competition because then the 80-20 doesn't actually work. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, in normal life, when I'm walking around and, you know, just trying to be me, uh, not a fucking superhero, 80-20 is the lifestyle that I live. And, and, and I know that that's something that you really strongly believe in. Can you, can you talk to us about 80-20 for a little bit? Our human nature is just to try to take on too much, consume too much, ask too many opinions, uh, you know, try too many things. So you're always going to have more success in life. I mean, there's Bruce Lee over my shoulders, talked about that quite a bit. And if you look at, if I look around the, the office here, like everyone who's on the wall is known 50, 100 years after their death because they did one thing. Like so many people try to do a million things. You can't do, you look at anomalies like the rocker Arnold who did, you know, three things at a high level, but they only did the one for so many years. Like the rock became the best wrestler in the world and then went on to become an actor. And Arnold did bodybuilding and then acting and then uh, politics. Like he didn't try to do those three at once because that would be insanity and you'd never get anywhere. So you need to, no matter what it is, in the, in the four different areas of your life, right? So you, you have your fitness, you gotta just simplify it. What's the diet that works for you? What are the 80% of the, uh, what are your 80% foods that you should eat all the time? Training, pick what works, find out something that works for you. Basic exercises, like stuff that's stood the test of time. And then when it comes to your relationships, okay, I need to improve my relationship with my wife. Well, there's a million things you could do. What's one powerful thing? Date night every Wednesday. Let's start with that. Perfect. Okay. Now for business, there's a million things you can do. What's the one most important thing I could do? Maybe it's for your business. Maybe it's put out uh, 500 words of content every day. Maybe it's put up a podcast. Maybe it's I don't know, like it just depends on your industry, but figure out what your one thing is. That's why I love the book, The One Thing, the book Essentialism, The 80-20 Principle. It's worth reading all of them just to hammer that kind of message home. And then the more you can simplify every aspect of your life, I think just think the more uh, successful you're gonna be, the happier you're gonna be, the less stress you're gonna have. Priority was never plural. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't exactly, that, yeah. it's that book, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's typically, it's, it's priority. What is your priority in life? Not what are your priorities in life? Because your priorities don't actually, will not be the number one thing, right? The priority is actually your, your, 
your number one thing. Yeah. And so this goes back to a lot of how we how we, we talked about earlier is having that morning, that proactive morning. It's like, what are the most important things? If you wake up and you have a to-do list like this, it's going to suck. Like you, you could probably get one to three really meaningful things done in that day. And so they talk about in the book, what's the one domino that can knock down everything else? So again, go through like the four different pillars of your life and figure it out. But for, for your business, what is it, you know? Um, so, so in the morning when you're, when you're being proactive, you're working on your most important thing. So maybe like if you have two, three hours of your morning, that's before you're reacting to stuff, maybe it's, you know, you got to get your workout in, you got to write 500 words or, you know, whatever it is that you need to do for your business and, you know, meditate or read something personal, like figure out what are those most important things. Cause we don't all have infinite time. We don't have, you know, limitless uh, capabilities to do all this stuff. We can only do so many things. Uh, in one lifetime. Whoever is listening right now, this is something that you can do that I'm currently doing because I heard Jay say it and I've actually passed on the advice and it's only been like a couple of weeks. You said that you spend the first half of your day or like the first few hours of your day doing proactive things. Mm -hmm. and, and you literally don't do any reactive things for the most part, until you're done with this sort of like morning routine that is all proactive, meaning you're not responding to emails, you're not jumping on social media, you're literally doing things that are like mindfulness focused, fitness focused, uh, any sort of blog or like, or, or, or sort of like something that you're putting out into the universe that is actually proactive, not responding or reacting to things that are coming your way. And Dude, when I heard that, I was like, that is so, like, I, I have a similar way. I just never articulated it that way. Um, but can you just talk to us about that for one quick sec? Because I think that is such a great piece of advice that anybody listening to this could potentially implement. Yeah, well, you know, so, there, I mean, there's so many different levels of that, but it's, you have to take care of yourself first. Like, you know, when I had you on the podcast, I thought the last five minutes, the way you summed it up, talking about how you put fitness before everything because it makes you so much better. I was like, oh man, this is amazing. Like you could make a three minute highlight video. There's been like a Rocky training montage with you talking in the background. But the point is you take care of yourself. A lot of people think that's selfish. You have to take care of yourself. So you have to figure out what's important to you. You know, what fills you up? You know, when, when, you know if the plane's going down, it's a cliche, but you put your mask on before you take care of other people. And, and so many of us don't do that because maybe because the way we are raised, our relationship with our, with our dad, whatever it might be, we become this Mr. Nice Guy people pleaser and you do everything for everyone all day. And then you end the day uh, full of uh, bitterness, anxiety, resentment, you know, towards your coworkers, towards your wife, towards whatever, but it's really you. You didn't prioritize what's important to you. So uh, get up in the morning and prioritize yourself before anyone else. Because then if you're filled, if you're fulfilled and filled up, then you can be a better husband, a better boss, a better coworker, whatever. Uh, and also you don't want to just wake up and look at your phone and go, oh, how fucked is the world today? Because then that's a downward spiral of stress and anxiety and negativity. It's like, let's wake up, let's fill our head with positive stuff. So I have a play mix. That's all positive stuff. It's like, you know, Eminem, the Roots, Royce, the Five Nine, the Superman theme song, the Rocky theme song. So I'm playing that I as love a that. coffee. <laughs> I love yeah. that. When you said that, I was like, dude, he has a playlist, a positive morning playlist that he listens to with music that actually fucking motivates him to like go out and crush. I love it. So can you just quickly take us through your morning so we yeah, all so just know what it's like? Yeah, so, so again, I'll, I'll have um, my, I'll wake up and then I meditate for five minutes. So I use an app and I just meditate for five minutes and just, I try to think of nothing, but if my mind's racing, then I'll just focus on a word and I'll actually see the word, like I'll have my eyes closed and I'll see the word just like on a white background and I'll just focus on the word, whatever the when word you, is. When you wake day. up, are you doing it while you're still lying down in bed or are you actually getting up and going somewhere to do it? I get up and go sit on the couch in the living room because uh, I don't keep my phone in the bedroom. I think that's horrible. So I'll, I'll go out there, put it on five minutes. And then, uh, then like I said, I throw on the coffee, throw on my, my mix to get myself pumped up for the day. While I'm doing that, I'm getting food ready and everything. I, uh, I do the journaling and 
Uh, then I'll read, I do two, two things. So I'll read uh, from uh, the Tao Te Ching or uh, Epictetus, something like that. Like I'll just read like one page journal, uh, a, a one page entry, and then I will do my journal. Then I just do some light mobility and then I get into whatever my most important task is, what I have to get done that day. So I'll just spend an hour or two focus, like, you know, emails off, phones off, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that's it. I, I'm not a guy who loves to train first thing in the morning. So, uh, I'll wait, I'll do, uh, two hours of focus work and then I'll train, you know, like when Tim Ferriss came out with a four hour work week, a lot of people tried that and it didn't work. And then Matt Fury, I don't know if you ever heard of Matt Fury. I have. Okay. So Matt Fury was the guy who was the first guy to sell info products online and in fitness and make seven figures and was crushing it. And Matt Fury was like, Four hour work week's impossible, but I believe in a four hour work day, you can get there. And you actually can uh, if you're super productive and focused and you apply 80 20. And you know, if you do all that stuff and take care of yourself, like I could six to 10 be done with my day. There's other things that I like to do and enjoy doing, but if we're going 80 20, I could be done at 10, six to 10. Tell me, just so, just so everybody knows, what is 80 20 exactly? So it's, uh, 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. Uh, in business, 80% of your uh, income will come from 20% of your clients. Like if you're a coach, you always have that 20% of people who stay with you for five years, 10 years, they, uh, they buy your platinum service. Uh, I'm sure you would probably agree, you know, if you own a restaurant, there's probably 20% of people that go in all the time. Like we have a few restaurants here that we got to know the people, we love them, so we go there all the time. And then I'll leave, you know, on holidays, I'll leave a hundred percent tip on a regular night. I'll leave a 35% tip, like things like that. Those will be your best clients. So if you could just apply this across the board, it, it, anything you look at it like in life, like again, fitness, family, finances, all this stuff. If, if you look at, if you really dial it in, it's only that small 20% and the, the other 80% that you could do. So if there's a hundred things you could do for your fitness, wipe 80 of them off, hundred things for business, wipe 80 of them off. Focus on that 20%. And really, it's not even 20 things. It's 20%, which more, is more like three to five really important things. Hip hop. Oh. We didn't talk about it on your podcast, so we got to talk about it now. You, uh, you got four hours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I, I am similar to you in that old school slash 90s hip hop are without a doubt hands down my go-to i'm yeah. i don't i don't say i dislike what's going on today but it certainly does not give me the feeling that i get when i listen to 80s and 90s hip-hop it just doesn't yeah. you know and and specifically for me because i really started listening to hip-hop um when i was probably like 10 11 years old Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was like the early nineties stuff that I just miss that sound so much, man. I miss it. So, especially East coast nineties hip hop. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, it's just, best, it's, best. nobody's really doing that, uh, anymore. Certainly nobody's doing the old school stuff. What do did you, did you see the, uh, the opening of the BET awards when public enemy did fight the power 2020? No. Oh, dude, I'm gonna text you the link to it. You gotta watch it. It's amazing. And and Nas and Black Thought join. It's unreal. They join really? with them. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Nas and Black Thought, those two guys, legends. Can't yeah. like Black Thought could be the best flow ever. Honestly. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, one, he's definitely one top of, five. He, yeah. he's, he's top five lyricists ever. Top three albums for you. Ooh, uh, low end theory. It takes a nation of millions. Um, mm. Oh, there's so many to choose from. I know the, those man, two. Not... I mean, the crazy thing is I could put midnight marauders there too. I mean, I just love tribe so much, you know, naughty by nature's first album was slept on by a lot of people. They know them as more pop, um, with, with hip hop array and stuff like that yeah. and OPP. But if you go and listen to naughty's first album, and realize that was 1991, Tretch is 19 at the time, and then you hear Jay-Z and so many of these people who have stolen or you know been influenced by Tretch, every single song on that album from start to finish is mind-blowing. And if you haven't heard it in 10, 15 years, I've turned people back on to it like, dude, this album is insane. 
Right now, that's probably not top three for me, but right now I'm just going to throw that out there because it's so good. I'm a massive fan of Black Moon and mm. that era. I yeah. feel like nobody really talks about that because I, I don't think that they were really deep underground hip hop. Like, I think yeah. that they were just, it was like, you know, Wu Tang, and then there was this like subset right under that crew. That was yeah. like Smith um, and Wesson, Black Smith Moon. and Wesson, Black Moon, Capone and Noriega, those guys. Last year, when I was training for this competition, I was trying to find something that I hadn't listened to in a long time that was just gonna fire me up in the gym, and I went back to my Wu Tang, like mm. you know, era, and dude, I like I just forgot how good I for like. The RZA, I mean, Liquid Swords, I think that could be oh, one yeah. of the best albums like ever made. I, like, classic. it's so good. I like, I remember that was like 19, I think it was like 1994 maybe when that album came out. 90, yeah. Somewhere between 90, 93, 90, 93 to 95, somewhere in there. And like, I just remember the first time I heard it and like that, that song just, fires me up man it's just so so good and there's yeah. not a lot today how do you feel about hip-hop today like what's your thoughts on hip-hop uh, today I, I feel like it's it's better now there was, there was a period i don't remember exactly where maybe five seven years ago i was like oh nothing good's coming out but uh you know i like kendrick i like j cole i, I like some of the new stuff i mean again I, the, the feeling i get from listening to the old stuff is, is completely different but um and then guys that, that, you know, we grew up with. I mean, Eminem we didn't grow up with, but Eminem's been at it for a long time. He's still putting out great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Black Thought's still putting out great stuff. Um, LL even. LL's still putting out great stuff. Like LL, uh, this was probably maybe six months ago. LL, he, he ne and he never put it out. He had Eminem on his show on, uh, on Backspin, and they talked for like an hour. And Eminem's like, when are you going to release this stuff? It's amazing. And LL put out this... Um, Dude, it was, I can't remember the name of the track, but it was fire. Like, he, he was really? so fierce. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got to check that out. See, for me, I have, and I want to ask your opinion on this. I have two different categories. When, I, when people say, who's your top five MCs? I think it's top five lyricists is very different from the top five overall MCs. So I'm going to explain what I mean, and then you tell me what you think. If I go top five lyricists, I got uh, Black Thought, Eminem, Nas, Rakim. And I, I could always argue the fifth guy. KRS one. Uh, I, you could you could argue that I'm gonna throw Big Daddy Kane in there for now, right? But if I go top five MCs, Biggie. which I mean overall influence, big picture, all that, and then how much I like them, I go Chuck D, uh, LL, Ice Cube. Uh, Eminem's probably the only guy that's in both for me, and maybe Jay Z. I mean, on any given day, there's a few that are interchangeable there. You see, what, does that make sense? Because some know, of the guys totally. lyrically, yeah. But I also think that there's, there's also a difference between lyrics and flow. And I honestly yeah. think that Biggie Smalls could have between, I think like flow wise, there's, you know, I, I feel like you can't really like, Rockham KRS One are like neck and neck for me, like in terms of like just like their what they did at that time and how they influenced the early, the '90s hip hop. Those two yeah. totally yeah. laid the groundwork for '90s hip hop. They were the they were the sort of conduit between old school and '90s hip hop. And then yeah. I just I just like in terms of flow, I just feel like Biggie Smalls and Jay Z. Those guys are hard to argue with, man. And Nas, yeah. too. Like, you can't yeah. really... Like, Nas Illmatic, I Amazing. think if somebody were to ask me what my favorite, favorite all-time hip-hop album is, it's probably Nas Illmatic. Just because that oh, okay. hit me. What, what else you got in there in your top three to five albums? Uh, Nas Illmatic, I would also have to say Midnight Marauders because I love it. Liquid Swords is definitely up there for me. For me, the music... It's not even so much about the lyrics. It's more about the when I hear the beat, where it takes me. And yeah, I just remember yeah. digging in the crates, Black Moon. I just know exactly where I was. Like I was right. I was in the East Village. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I was like 12 yeah. years old. I like, I just, I just, it, it brings me to this place where every single time I hear it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so fire. Like, I, I like, this is all I, I want to like go back there. I remember going out like in the late nineties and early two thousands in the city and, uh, we would see Jay Z all the time. Uh, you probably went, to I, the I was, you probably went to yeah. life. Dude, we used to go to life. We used to go to butter. We used to go to uh plaid, I mean, well spa, which then became plaid and uh, DJ AM was in there all the time. And, um, uh, 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 Mark Ronson. So, so we were in there, which I'm sure you were in there too, like the beginning of mashups. Remember that? Like, like Mark Ronson started doing mashups. I felt like at Spa was the first time I ever heard a mashup mm -hmm. where he'd be playing Biggie or something and all of a sudden it would go into uh, Nirvana, Teen mm -hmm. Spirit or something. People would lose their minds. Yeah. I was, so I was working at Life when I was 15, 16, 17 wow. years old. I was working there and, uh, I remember seeing all those guys. It was crazy. I don't know how I got a job in the uh, job in the club so young, but I was a bar back there, and it was like the coolest job ever because I was in yeah. high school. I was a complete maniac. I moved out of my parents' house really young, but I was like working all night and seeing all these celebrities and like being up in the club. It was, it was those times, man. Any any kind of advice that you just believe will give people the kick in the ass or that one push over that they that push over the edge to get them to do the thing that they've been talking about doing and haven't taken the step to do. Most of the things that hold you back are just in your mind. Like nobody's judging you the way we think that everyone is. Nobody cares. They're they're concerned with their own shit, how they look, how they're doing. So we've built up this thing and maybe it's because our parents told us or you know, the bullies told us that, whatever. We've been lied to and we have these self-limiting beliefs and we think it's true, but it's not true. Nobody gives a shit about you. They only care about themselves. So, and, and you know, a lot of people think there's so many haters in the world, but really you get what you're looking for, you know, and you, you see in life what you consume, what you read, what you hear. So even though we see a lot of hate, you know, you watch the news and you read comments on social media, you see a lot of hate. In the real world, people do want you to succeed, I believe, more so than fail. And they will be inspired by it. They will help you. Um, you know, the, the Ben Franklin rule is that if you ask somebody for help, they'll feel more favorably towards you. So don't be scared to ask for help. Last question, Jay. Do you believe that you were born to get to where you're at today or made over time through sheer grit, determination and, and hard work? Made. I mean, no, no disrespect to my parents, but I didn't have the greatest genetics for sports or, uh, Z transformation or anything like that. I was never the smartest kid, never got the greatest grades. Uh, I found it really hard to pay attention. Like back then, I don't think we, we got diagnosed with ADHD, but I was always just staring out the window. Uh, everything was a struggle for me. So I had to work really hard and the work is never done. Um, every single day, I think all of us should strive to get better in every single way. Like I, I wanna be a better friend. I wanna be a better listener. I wanna be more present. I want to be able to make better decisions. I want my training to be more efficient. Uh, you know, I want to be able to retain uh, new knowledge. So like all these things you, you work every day to get better at. And the weird thing is in retrospect, I didn't really think about personal development and getting better until I was in my early thirties. I kind of just thought, which a lot of people do think, this is how I was born. This is how my family is. This is how I've always been. This is how it's always done. You can't do this. And I, so I was kind of like just trapped in that small minded world for so many years. And then I just started surrounding myself with the right people, uh, consuming the right content, reading the right books, going to the right events. And I was like, man, anybody can do anything. You can drastically, dramatically change your life, your belief system, but it is a lot of work. It's a 24 seven thing for the rest of your life. I love that, man. I believe wholeheartedly that people can change and I hate when people say or when you hear and you hear more so than not hear people can't change I yeah, disagree I, I uh, fucking disagree totally. anyway dude you're the man I really appreciate you I appreciate the content you put out I appreciate what you've done uh, you've paved the path for so many people in the industry uh, that you're in and the industry that I love passionately um, as like really hobby uh, so it's, it's, it's awesome to be able to get to know you and, uh, and I'm sure everybody's going to be able to pull some awesome, awesome stuff out of this podcast.
So thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate it. All right, dude. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, keep you inspiring too. us, man.